from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Buonasera. Buonasera a tutti. <laughs> uh, welcome. We are very pleased to have you here this evening for this wonderful event, uh, the first week of Italian cuisine in the world, so very uh, exciting. And we are very pleased to have two wonderful food historians and chefs here. Um, before I introduce them, I, I would like to talk a little bit about the Italian collections of the Library of Congress. We have 450,000 items across divisions in our collections, so it's quite a, quite a huge collection. And for Italian cooking, I counted 1,900 books for Italian cooking alone. So um, we have a small display outside. It's, it shows a range of books um, in our general collections. But one of these days, we will also have a nice exhibit of our rare books and special collections. Um, so I am Lucia Wolf. I work at the European Division. I am responsible for the Italian collections, of course, and uh, also of Malta, uh, Vaticano, San Marino, and Italian Switzerland. So those are my fields. If you ever have some questions, please come and see me. Anybody can uh, request and use our books at the Library of Congress, so we're happy to be here and to help you all out. Um, but let's, uh, let's introduce our speakers. So, Domenica Marchetti. Domenica Marchetti grew up in an Italian family. Her mother is from Chieti in Abruzzo. Uh, and uh, uh, of her family, Domenica says, at the dinner table, we spent more time talking about what we should eat the next day rather than <laughs> politics and the news of the day. I can relate being Italian, but I have to say that I had some of my best political discussions with my father at the dinner table. Um, Domenica uh, refers to another experience. Um, uh, uh, she says that her mother had her sister and her shaping gnocchi and ravioli by the time they could see over the kitchen counter. This too is a very common uh, experience in Italian families. Uh, Domenica graduated from Columbia School of Journalism, started her career as a newspaper reporter and wrote about a lot of topics until she realized that writing about Italian food was her calling. Um, her recipes and articles on Italian cuisine are featured in many national publications including Cooking Light, Fine Cooking, Food and Wine, the Chicago Tribune, the Washington Post, and the list goes on and on. <laughs> so um, um, she is the author of seven books, which we do have, I am happy to say, in our collections at the library, Preserving Italy, <coughs> Canning, Curing, Infusing, and Bottling Italian Flavors and Traditions is her latest book, 2016. Thank you, Connie, for bringing her personal copy over because I had trouble <laughs> um, getting, requesting the book. Ciao Biscotti, The Glorious Vegetables of Italy, The Glorious Pasta of Italy, William Sonoma, Rustic Italian, uh, Simple, Authentic Recipes for Everyday Cooking, Big Night In, More Than 100 Wonderful Recipes for Feeding Family and Friends Italian Style, and The Glorious Soups and Stews of Italy. To learn more about Domenica, uh, you can refer to her blog, blog domenicacooks.com. Uh, now for Amy Riolo. Amy Riolo is no stranger to the Library of Congress. She has been here on various occasions for various lectures. But um, for those who do not know about Amy, she is an award-winning, best-selling author, chef, television personality, and in this case, too, the, it goes on and on. I wouldn't have enough time to, <laughs> to talk about all of Amy's achievements here. Amy comes from an American family, originally from Calabria. Calabria is southern Italy, the tip of the boot, I like saying, so you get a, an idea of where that is. 
Uh, she graduated from Cornell University and set out to become one of the most respected culinary diplomats and advocates of the Mediterranean diet. Her most recent book, The Italian Diabetes Cookbook, rele was released on January um, uh, 2016 and is in our display, among other books by Amy. Uh, among them, The Ultimate Mediterranean Diet Cookbook, The Mediterranean Diabetes Cookbook, Nile Style Egyptian Cuisine and Culture, Arabian Delights, Recipes and Princely Entertaining Ideas from the Arabian Peninsula. Um, she, uh, she makes, Amy makes frequent appearances on many television and radio programs, including Fox TV, ABC, CBS, NBC, Nile TV, and Abu Dhabi <laughs> Television. Um, she was in Morocco just before coming here. <laughs> um, yes, uh, her delicious recipes grace the pages of many newspapers and magazines, including USA Today, Cooking Light, The Washington Post, CNN.com, and the, uh, the Wall Street Journal. Again, the list goes on and on. Um, if you would like to learn more about Amy, her blog, amyriolo.com, is full of interesting information and wonderful recipes, uh, such as her mouth-watering mussels in tomato saffron broth that made me want to get up and, and make it <laughs> last Sunday. <laughs> so it is impossible for me to say more about Amy's and Domenica's achievements in such a brief introduction, and I will let the speakers do it for themselves. And now to Domenica Marchetti and Amy Riolo. Enjoy. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Lucia, for the, that lovely introduction. And hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us um, this evening. Uh, I was um, contacted by Renato from the Italian Embassy to speak about Italian uh, food, which is a subject near and dear to my heart. I have seven books on Italian cooking, so it's something I think about pretty much 24-7. Um, and I was thinking about the theme of this week, Italian food in the world, Italian cuisine in the world. And so I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview and my thoughts on that subject. And then Amy has uh, prepared a wonderful PowerPoint um, presentation for us. Um, I was thinking about my most recent book, Preserving Italy. And the double entendre is um, definitely on purpose there in the title of the book. Um, on the surface, it's a book about Italian preserving traditions in the kitchen. Um, sotogli, sotaceti, so foods preserved in oil, foods preserved in vinegar, marmalades, jams, fruit pastes, syrups, liqueurs, um, e everything from those things to fresh cheeses and salumi. Um, because if you think of the Italian table, um, so many foods that come to the Italian table are foods that have been preserved, preserving the bounty. Um, of Italian ingredients. Um, and even if you're not Italian, chances are you are familiar with most of these foods. If you go to just about any supermarket these days, you will find jars of giardiniera or roasted peppers or pancetta and guanciale in the deli department. Um, when I was growing up, these things were not quite as common as they are now, but they are pretty much everywhere. Um, but beyond that, the book is also about preserving these traditions, these ways, these food ways, these ways of these uh, techniques. And, um, you know, the world is ever changing. Italy is changing. And so it was important to me, as somebody who loves Italian cuisine, to try to maybe bottle some of these um, recipes and old traditions in, in this book. Um, I have to say, though, ultimately it's kind of a futile endeavor because food is always evolving, cuisine is always evolving. Um, and when you think about Italian food in the world, um, you know, you really do see that. Um, and the more I thought about this subject, the more I realized that Italian food or the food of the peninsula, I should say, before there was in Italy. Um, there's always been the food of the Italian peninsula out in the world, um, whether it was through the fr spread of the Roman Empire to uh, food traditions that traveled to France with Caterina de' Medici, um, and also the foods that uh, Thomas Jefferson introduced to the U.S. after traveling to Italy, um, including pasta or macaroni, um, 
gelato, ice cream, and even rice uh, he brought back. Nowadays, um, we have chefs who, you know, even here in D.C., who travel to Italy in search of authentic recipes, and they bring them back um, to their own restaurants here in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world. Um, so that's a little bit of an overview about Italian food in the world. But as I was thinking of the subject, I thought, you know, it's, it's not just that. If you turn it around, you have um, the world in Italian food or the world of Italian food. And so that's kind of looking things uh, at things in a different perspective. There's always been a cross-cultural influences in what we broadly refer to as Italian cuisine, uh, whether they're, this is the result of war, invasion, religion, migration, travel, and so on. So, um, you know, you think about Sicilian food and the influence of Arab and African um, culture and, and ingredients on the food of Sicily. Uh, and you think of the New World and the ingredients brought from the New World back to Italy. Potatoes, peppers, tomatoes. I mean, to me, the aroma of roasted peppers is the aroma of Italy. But of course, and you know, in, in the history of the world, peppers are a pretty recent introduction uh, to, into the cuisine of, of the Italian peninsula. So, um, and, and the, uh, in the 18th and 19th century, we had the so-called British invasion of Italy, where a lot of British people, uh, you know, the poets, the romantics, um, moved to Italy, wrote about uh, the Italian landscape, and they brought with them things like roast beef. So even today, if you go to Tuscany, you can find in the trattorias roast beef, which is basically, an, uh, you know, the Tuscan variation of a British food. Um, so all of these things were kind of rolling around in my head, and, and um, it's a very complex subject, as we know. And uh, as I was thinking of it, I thought of my friend Amy, who is um, a food historian and a cookbook author, and um, just a, a really a font of knowledge on the history of Italian cuisine. So I asked her to come with me and delve into this subject today, and she's prepared a wonderful PowerPoint, which we're going to kind of get into slide by slide, and talk a little bit about um, the evolution of Italian cuisine from the beginning. Uh, to now, and also kind of look back at the evolution of or uh, how world cuisine has influenced the food of Italy. So um, without further ado, I'd like to for us to get, get started on the PowerPoint. Please, um, we will be taking questions afterward. We'd love to hear your perspective. We'd love to hear your, your comments, your own experiences. Um, you know, whether you're Italian or not, I think pretty much everybody in the world loves Italian food, so, and, and everybody has an opinion about it, an opinion, an opinion about it, too, so. Uh, okay, Amy, come on over. Thank you so much, Dominica. Thank you all so much for coming this afternoon. What a huge pleasure and honor it is to have all of you here. As I look around, I see a lot of familiar faces, some of you from prominent Italian organizations, the embassy, others really important Italian restaurants and other restaurants, chefs here with us today and people from the Library of Congress who I've known for years. So it's great to be in such good company. And I'm really grateful to Domenica. Um, we've worked together for years now on, on different topics and doing different discussions for the National Italian American Foundation, for Les Dames d'Escoffier, for different things that we work with. And if, if there's no other takeaway than anything else today, what I would like for everybody to remember is that there is room for more than one Italian. Because, you know, as an Italian or as an Italian American, in, in any field, there is one box. And if it's filled, if Domenica's doing it, I'm not doing it. If I'm doing it, she's not doing it, or vice versa. So there's so much to say, as you're going to see, you know, on the topic of Italian cuisine, that there could be 50 of us, 5,000 of us here, and we would all have something unique to say. And I, I thought of that last night, because we were talking a little bit about today, and I said, you know, we're talking about a very unique niche topic. She has a completely different view than me. We're Italian-American, we're women, we're authors, we're, but very different. So that's the, that's the first thing I'd like to say before we start. And the other thing is, this is a very large topic. I'll start teaching a series on on, in, in January, every uh, Tuesday evening, I'll, I'll teach an Italian culinary appreciation certification series at, at uh, L'Academie de Cuisine in Bethesda. But it, it will take even more than that one semester to talk. So, so please don't, don't hate us if we left out uh, your favorite topic. We can, <laughs> we'll address it in yeah. the Q&A. So here are some things, if anybody's on uh, the internet and would like to use some hashtags, November 16th officially uh, is the start off of the Italian Cuisine in the World Week, so feel free to use that hashtag since this is the first one. We can try to get some traction and make this a really popular event. This, uh, these are all of our handles. 
And then a couple of fun facts. Italian food is now the number one in the cuisine in the U.S. and in the world. Um, more pizza is eaten per ca capita in the U.S. <laughs> than in Italy. And pizzas served to Americans on July 4th and troops overseas. Uh, Italian food, of course, is also the most mis represented and misunderstood in the world. So we're going to talk a little about that. The made in Italy labeling, the geographic indicators are very, very important for that reason. We'll talk about those. And only a third of the Italian, f Italian foods that are eaten in the world actually come from Italy. So we're going to discuss the history of Italian food, some cultural events that influence the cuisine. We'll also talk about Italian cuisine today and its influence in the world. So I'm going to start back with the 8th century before the Common Era in Magna Grecia. So this is my ancestral homeland of Calabria, specifically the town of Crotone. And in Calabria and in Lucania, the neighboring Lucania, they had something called lagane, which were the original pasta. So many, many centuries before the Etruscans had pasta and people were starting their theories about Marco Polo and things like that, we had had Lagane in um, one of some of the first indigenous settlements in Italy. Uh, that's the Temple of Hera that you see, and this is Pythagoras down below because they both had places in Crotone, believe it or not. All of southern Italy at this time was very important for, it, for Greece. It was called the Magna Grecia. And so a lot of famous foods came from Greece and went back to Greece at that very, very early age, in addition to what was already found there. And these pasta, this type of pasta that's called lagane, you can still find around today. Um, as Domenica mentioned, people are trying to preserve some recipes, and there are mo uh, movements taking place to preserve these recipes. Lagane comes from the Greek word lagana, which was a bread eaten on clean Monday. And uh, so this, this idea of paste or dough came over into Calabria and we started using that. Then if we go in, into Rome and we look at places like Hadrian's Villa and what the emperors were doing, we get a very good glimpse into, you know, quote, Italian food culture very, very early on because the Romans were great purveyors of food and they really wanted the best of everything. So they would send fleets out into North Africa and into China, bringing back the best spices from China. The be they wanted the best shrimp from just the right time from the catch off the shore of Libya. They had people tracking these things so that they knew they were great, great purveyors of food from early on. Here on the left, we see Hadrian's Villa, and then on the right we can see uh, the Temple of Karnak in Egypt. So there was a lot of synergy back then between ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, and ancient Rome. Here are some an example from uh, 180 of the Common Era. We can see what the trade routes looked like then. So you know, for people who are thinking we don't have transport, people were landlocked, they didn't have the globalization that we had today. This is how much influx they had going and coming from. Already at that time, the food the food was a fusion. And then we talk about uh, some different things and really a development of early Italian cooking. We can talk about Apicius. So Apicius was a Roman philosopher. He wrote the first cookbook that we know about in the West called De Re Cocinaria, or On Cooking. And this cookbook is still around today. You can see uh, different, different uh, types of it. It's also been translated. And Apicius was a poor philosopher. He loved food. He, had a, he was a great, like a bon gustaio, as we say in Italian, but he couldn't afford his palate. He had the palate of an emperor, but but the budget of a philosopher. So he actually committed suicide because he couldn't afford to eat the way he wanted. So he is believed to be the father of all gourmands and chefs. We all admire him and revere him for this reason. But um, in Apish's cookbook, he wrote about a lot of things from a lot of different places. And one of the things he wrote about was Numidia and this place called Numidia Quadrata. If any of you have ever taken the metro in Rome, you might know there's a stop on the metro called Numidia Quadrata. And it refers to this place, which you see over on the right. It's the square area of, but from Rome south into North Africa, which was Roman territory. So this was the bread basket for the Romans. And with the wheat and different ingredients that they got there, those were currency in antiquity. So they could trade and they could fund the entire Roman Empire all the way up to Great Britain just from what came out of Numidia Quadrata. So this was like the administrative capital. And when I was in uh, Morocco, it just came back uh, Saturday night, one of the things, places I took my guests was to Volobolis, which was one of the out Roman outposts in Morocco. Beautiful, you see, can see the, the olive oil presses and, and just, you know, the amazing infrastructure that the Romans had and how important food was back then and, and lifestyle. And then if we go forward, uh, we can go all the way to the ninth century um, and talk about some of the influences that were taking place in Sicily and in different places. But what I'd like to mention also before that is um, there were many different regions and empires and places that were indigenous settlements in Italy long before 
we had some of these invading forces or new forces coming in. We look at the Romans a lot because they were such an impressive empire. They have so many things that you can trace back and look at them and know what is Roman. And a lot of Italian Americans really identify, and Italians identify themselves with what is Rome because Rome is so important in the world. But there were a lot of other indigenous tribes that run too, like the Etruscans in Tuscany. Like in Calabria, we had the Italian, the Inotri. In um, Puglia, they had the Apulians. So these people were already there, already had their own culture. And then if the Romans were to come in through the area, they were another culture coming in. It's not like everybody was Roman. So that's an important distinction to make. And then if we look into the ninth century, uh, two very important prominent groups came in from North Africa into Sicily. Uh, one was the Aglabids, and they came in in 827. Now, the reason Sicily was so important is because it's the largest island in the Mediterranean. It was the center of trade. So at any caliphate wanted to claim Sicily before it claimed other areas. And sometimes Sicily was actually known as a caliphate. So the Aglabids came from what was now known as modern day Tunisia. And they named Marsala, which means Mars Allah, or the, the Marsh of Allah, they, the Port of Allah, they named it that. And they also brought in a lot of different um, ingredients with them, a lot of lemons, a lot of mulberries, a lot of different uh, citrus and couscous and things like that. And they would plant the fruits on the base of Mount Etna. <coughs> So all of that rich soil really enriched a lot of the products and made them superior. If you go to North Africa today, the little lemons and, and oranges are like this big. They're very delicious. They're sweet. They're own variety. But they took a whole new thing once they got enriched from that volcanic soil. So when, sometimes if you ever see, if you're in a store and you see something, you know, grown in the volcanic ash of Etna or Sicily, and you're like, that's just a marketing ploy. It really, if it really was, it really, it's not a marketing ploy. It's, it's unique. It's different. Those years and years of ash really make a superior and a different product. So that's interesting to know about um, and interesting to talk about. Um, and then in 917, the Fatimids came. And the Fatimids were really, really important. They were also, they were a Shiite group also from North Africa, from what is now Tunisia. But they were important because they first claimed Sicily, Palermo is their capital, and then 50 years later they claimed Cairo. So that's how important Sicily was to them. And there was a lot of synergy back and forth between Cairo and Sicily because of that in those days. Also, the Fatimids were really big into kind of cross-cultural celebrations. So they would have religious festivals. They didn't care if people were Jewish or Christian or Muslim. They would have these festivals and then they would make what we now know as torrone or the sesame candy and things like that. And those would be the sweets of the different festivals. And they would encourage everybody to eat them. So nowadays, if you go to the feast... Well, I was going to say, you <laughs> still see these um, these sweets at, at uh, community festivals. That's the, right. The sugared almonds, the torrone. And if you go to, you know, the, the, the Feast of Santa Rosalia in Sicily, you'll see them. Or if you go to the Prophet Muhammad's birthday in Cairo, you'll see them. Nobody realizes that people are across the pond, or especially the, the more provincial people, don't realize that people are eating them for different reasons. But they're, they're one of the very early examples that we have of a food that, that goes across cultures. And um, they became a very, very powerful, powerful group. And then the next big time period that we have, if we leap forward, that we can talk about is the Renaissance. And as Domenica mentioned early, uh, earlier, Caterina de' Medici, when she married Henry II and moved to Paris, she brought with her all of her cooks. So she, this huge brigade of pastry chefs and regular chefs. So what we now know, is what became the, the um, Grand Cuisine movement in Paris was actually influenced by Florentine cuisine. We couldn't call it Italian at that time because we, we didn't think of things as Italy. It was pre pre that, but it was Florentine, and the, many of the French chefs will will um, you know have studied that in, in in history. So things like onion soup, things like that we call French onion soup, crepes, uh, duck à l'orange, these types of things, the amaretti cookies fused into what we now know as the macaron. So there were many many uh, elevated dining styles, but also specific recipes that. Um, uh, the Medici's brought with them to Paris. And then another important thing to think about, if we're kind, kind of trying to get our minds wrapped around what was taking place in the time of the Renaissance, and you know, so much wealth and so much learning and so much knowledge, but still so much trade with the East that at that time an Oriental carpet was worth more than the David. Can you imagine? And it could, if you took it to nowadays standards, so you have to think about that. So if an oriental carpet was worth more, imagine how much spices were worth. Imagine how much other things that were coming. Blown glass, for example, from Syria was really close to priceless at that time. They had so many knockoffs and they used to write in fake Arabic to try to sell them. And, and I say this as it applies to food because that the food was also influenced from those styles. So we see a lot of spices starting to come in and people like, you know, 
beyond the Medici's wanting to show off at the banquet, even in, at the papal banquets and the things that were going on at the Vatican, when they wanted to have something luxurious, they added spice because it showed that they had money. Spice was a form of currency. Um, spice was used as med a traditional medicinal. Spice was used as a show of wealth, to, as a mood enhancer, all kinds of different things. But at that time, Venice and Istanbul, over top right, and Cairo were all sister cities, and they were all inv involved in the spice trade. All of those cities, the things would go around and around, the merchants would just keep bringing them back and forth, were all built pretty much on spice. All of the beauty, that you know, all of the grandeur, all of the wonderful wealth that is hard to even comprehend today, that maybe we would think about it with petroleum, they were all built on spice. One of the unique things that happened, though, to Venice in terms of, that didn't happen to other cities was when the Dutch later on found a new trade route to the east, they didn't need these cities anymore. So they were all going to go bankrupt. And they knew there was like a little bit of advance warning that they all knew they were going to suffer from these new trade routes and not needing the Mediterranean, the Middle East anymore. But what the Venetians did was really cool was they took the residual money that they had. And instead of holding on to it because they were going to go bankrupt, they actually spent it on the frescoes that you can see on the canal. So all of this additional beauty came out of a time that most people would have been really worried about failure. And then, of course, Venice became a popular tourist destination because it was so beautiful. So it helped us to kind Kind of you know lived through that moment and it's a it's a really good example of of food and culture and, and kind of cities in the world um, then again we have to talk about da vinci because in in i would have loved to talk about you know 500 different figures but to, to choose one this is important because in the 15th century in the 16th century when you're looking at all of these titles that had, Lucia was making fun of me because I have three slashes in my professional title, but look at his, and they were all like that. And it wasn't the first time, you know, there were many, many people during the Renaissance, hence the term Renaissance man. In two centuries prior in Baghdad, many of those scholars were also like that. They had all of these same things. And so as we were taking many ideas from the East, so was this idea of being able to do many things, of expanding the mind, of no limits, of not having to be so focused, of, of science and, and knowledge and learning and math and food and all being intertwined. We also see more formal ways of writing about food and appreciating food because for a while, you know, that food was just something that you would talk about for the wealthy, for the, the upper class, for the people in the palaces. And now we start to see it really being looked at as a science. And it's, it's thanks to people like this in addition to all of the many wonderful advancements that they made in society. And then as, as Domenica mentioned, Columbus, and of course coming to the New World, and regardless of the, of the individual that came or, or you know what the reasons behind that were, the, there was definitely with the Spanish all of this influx of new ingredients that came to Italy. And Italy really, really embraced every single one. Um, what's interesting is some of, because of the, the Turkish influence, and the Turks were in charge of a lot of trade at the time, a lot of the products um, that were new into Italy got Turkish names. So like you know, products that are made with corn a lot of times get called grano turco or Turkish grain. It had nothing to do with Turkey other than that the Turks were the middlemen. Turkish coffee, you know, they didn't get the coffee from Turkey, but they were bringing it around, so it got labeled as Turkish. And so we see these words a lot of times in Italy, and it, it, it you know, up until very recently, if someone in a very small community came from another place, a lot of times people called them a Turk because they came from a part. So you can't always use etymology in food history. Sometimes it leads you to something different. It's just a little little provincial provincial thing. Um, we have corn, tomatoes, potatoes, vanilla, avocados, peppers, all kinds of things coming from the New World. And here's an example of, you know, some different dishes. This, this one's a, a Calabrese dish on the left. They have a saying that if it has peppers and tomatoes and onions, it's Calabrese. But um, as we can see, a lot of those ingredients, um, you know, two of those ingredients at least came from, from the New World. And many people don't realize uh, what Italian food would be without tomato sauce prior to the 15th century. But Dominic and I actually have a colleague who wrote a book called Beyond the Red Sauce. His name is Chef Matt Finarelli. And it's all recipes without tomato sauce that were done uh, prior to the 15th century. So you can find that if you're very interested. Another thing that we have to think about in Italian food is um, the idea of realism and the idea of showing food like it is and this kind of more modern approach and the way that we eat today. You know, the way we eat today, even if you go to a, a restaurant and you look at a menu, it will tell you the ingredients. It will say such and such salad, then it will say tomatoes slash cucumbers slash onion. We list the ingredients. That would not have happened in the Renaissance. In the Renaissance, they would want 50 million different ingredients in there, you know, wrapped in a crust, which is, has an animal in it, which is stuffed with something else. And really, you had to, like, guess. The food was like magic and a work of art and a surprise and these kind of things. So, okay, but I have, so you're talking about the rest Renaissance and sure. Florence and all of that. So what about the Cucina Povera and it, it, when did that come about? I mean, was that always there as well? Um, you know, you think of the 
the fagioli and and um, just very I think of, of Florentine cuisine today as very minimalist almost so um, when would that have come about we're gonna get to that in the slide okay. in a little bit it was always there mm -hmm. but it came about more as a force mm -hmm. a couple a couple mm -hmm. hundred years later mm -hmm. so we're gonna get to that but but a, a, a similarity with the art which we may be seeing at the at the National Gallery if people go to that uh, talk is something about Caravaggio and Titian using the realism in their work and showing things portraying as they are more than than creating like uh, things in a kind of a fantasy world, we're also going to see that with the, with the food. Um, and then we have these, um, some of the influences that start coming into the United States. And we look at uh, the different influences on Italian architecture and things that our presidents were looking at. And as Domenica mentioned earlier, definitely the food and the wine of Jefferson. And when we, there are even these clips that you can find of um, the influence that Jefferson was under of the Italians. And he had a winemaker who was Italian, right? right that he brought over, yes, exactly. Yeah. So he brought Matze over, and he has this little letter to him. This is, I thank you for obliging, um, the obliging act of your culture of wine, and I'm happy to hear that your plantation of them is in so prosperous a way. So um, also, he brought over people to teach Italian and to start an Italian studies program. So definitely a big proponent of Italian culture. He also smuggled rice into the United States um, <laughs> from the risotto. So even though it has nothing to do nowadays with the risotto and what grows in the south but you can see the similarities um, from them just because he, he got it and he brought it in so we have we have also our rice industry to, to thank uh, Jefferson and the Italians for and uh, here we are Library of Congress um, <laughs> go around you know some of the some of the different buildings and you can see just um, how beautiful a lot of the Italian architecture is um, and here's when we start to get more into the topic about the Cucina Povera and, and that whole thing and, and how it started. So 1892 is when we really see the mass emigration into the Americas. And as Italians, as you know, people who are studying Italy, anybody who cares about Italy at all, if you look at this time period, that's all you're going to see. But there's a lot else going on in Italy too. So we're going to present a little bit of both of that today. So we see that you know the emigration coming and people leaving and people having to leave. And that, of course, changes a lot about what food is known as in the world. Here in America, if you study any of the, the textbooks from you know what they were teaching in the tenements and things like that, they would actually send social workers to the Italian neighborhoods in New York and they would have them come with their clipboards and you know they'd like analyze the families and they'd say oh you know you came from Italy and you've got these kids and you know they're, they're you're just feeding them starch and there's no protein and vegetables that's not good they need meat and potatoes they're not going to live this is this is America this is what we do we're advanced there was a lot of propaganda to get people to eat meat and potatoes so in addition to poverty being new immigrants you know poor conditions what they were living in and food not being available, they were also being told this is the way you have to eat. So, as you know, if anybody ever criticizes what happened to the you know Italian American food, there's there's a there's a really strong reason to it. And, and in a certain way, I think it's amazing that so many food trends stayed despite everything that people went through. Right. Um, now, again, at the same time, you know, not too much before in Italy, as we're talking about despair and people are people talk about why people had to flee. There was also a lot of very great things going on. Um, considering opera to be one of them, and Puccini was born in um, 1858 in Lucca. So Lucca's in Tuscany, and what he ate would have been known, he was from, uh, would have been known as Lucchese, or the specific food from his town. So here we see some more examples of Tuscan food, um, and then because it was a feudal town and it was known for its wealth, later on when it started going through economic de decline, this is really when um, this term that Cucina Povera got coined and people started talking about it. Because it was happening at the same time as the mass immigration, then it got brought here. And then anything that came, you know, with these poor people was poor. And a lot of times what was what was Italian was poor because it was coming with, with people. But when it went around, you know, through the opera stars and through the other things, then it had a different connotation. And also it's important to note some very simple ingredients like beans, like wheat, fava beans, for example, the world's oldest agricultural crop, cheap as could be. <clears throat> plentiful and easy to find. But they were, you know, very expensive at the time. They were a currency. Lentils were a currency. They were worth their weight in gold. So things change at different times. And, and I like to be very careful about what I call poor and rich, because it's all in the matter of the way you look at it. Plus, if it's good for you, then it has a wealth, I think, all of its own. So here are some of the examples of the cucina povera that, that uh, Domenica was talking about. We have the polenta and we have the panzanella salad. We have the, the pan cotto. So the, so the the first two are recipes made out of bread. So the pan, co the, the pan cotto on the bottom is a soup made out of cooked bread. It's just leftover bread made into a soup. Um, 
you know, obviously a very cheap and expensive thing to make, but when done well, there are a few things that, that taste as great. And nowadays, a homemade, authentic, honest stock is probably one of the biggest luxuries, I think, you know, in humankind. Um, then we have the Pancinella salad, which uh, leftover bread, people are making advantage of, the, uh, taking advantage of the good bread to, to turn it into the salad in polenta. So polenta comes from cornmeal. Corn, of course, was brought back with uh, Columbus, often called grano turco, and made into this dish called polenta. This is our Italian version of of grits, but people didn't like it. It didn't catch on very quickly. People were suspicious of it. It looked like food that you would feed to the animals, and it really didn't have a, you know, much of a repertoire. But it caught on with the Jewish community in the north, and they started eating it. And then it, little by little, it became a little bit more widespread. It spread to the south. And then in the south, a lot of the farmers started eating it before they went out into the fields in the morning. So it would be a base. They would eat it with meat, and they would eat these very big, untraditional, not what we think of as Italian breakfast, because they had to work the, um, they had to work the land. And then in 1889, the first pizzeria was born. So we all know, of course, we don't have to tell anybody how popular pizza is, but it's very important that it has the, the pizzeria, and it's important that you look at uh, the queen, Margarita, and why what she has to do with the pizza. Does anybody know the story? Okay, okay, so some of you. So, you know, it was a very humble food. It was a street food. It wasn't something that the, the, the queen would order. But how they used to sell the pizza was, if anybody's ever been to Istanbul or Cairo and you see the people walk around with those big aluminum tanks that are they're giving water or juice or something from these things that are strapped onto them, well, they used to strap ovens onto themselves and go, they were like human vendors, and they would heat the pizza up and sell it on the street. It was very, very poor you know, food. And the queen had a, a craving for one, so she ordered one up to the castle. They made the, the tricolor one for her in honor of the Italian flag, and this is how we got the, the margarita pizza. So you can still go to visit this pizzeria brandi if you go to uh, Naples. And then uh, also Verdi. So it's important to think about opera, again, once again, at this time period, because opera was so important. And I do whole lectures on the influence of opera on food, but um, Verdi was very closely associated with Risorgimento, so his work was very political, and a lot of his, his writings and his music had understated political hidden messages. And these are important because at the same time, all of this unification was going on in Italy, so there was a need for unification of food. They were actually looking for food that would bring the country together, because at the time, the foods were all very regional and very different, and, and that's how we still like to kind of look at it today. But they were looking, as they were looking for a, a, a hero, a singer, a sports figure, they also wanted food. And um, one of the things that Verdi's legacy left was he created some songs and popularized some songs around the Italian songs around the world that, you know, our people just hear the, the tune and they start humming them. And that's, that's one of the many things that, that he gave us in terms of culture. Um, so if you look at Milan in that time where the La Scala is and the Teatro and very fine dining and, and wonderful things are happening there today in terms of gastronomy, we can also, you know, way back in his time, this, it wasn't that much going on at that time. So they had a lot of local products. They had the wonderful dairy that they had. They had the farms and things like that. Risotto, minestre, and freshwater fish. This was the basis of what was going on in uh, Milan at the time, and Verdi also has a risotto named after him. So you can look this up online if, you ever, if you're a Verdi fan and make this risotto when you, when you listen to the opera. But here are the, the regions as they are today, as I mentioned. So, you know, they weren't exactly the same at that time, but you can see kind of the differences and how they evolved and how they developed and what's unique to one another. Even within the regions, there are still differences between the town. Even, you know, a town one hour away, two hours away will have a different dialect, different food, different terrain. And uh, when you go, you get to see it. And this, as Domenica mentioned, really helped to shape the, the different things of the food. So one region that we know of very, very well for food in the world today is the region of Emilia Romagna, and especially the, the town of Parma. So Parmigiano Reggiano is the most famous cheese from there and the most famous cheese known around the world. It's said that Benjamin Franklin even tried to get the recipe. And it has an eight century history, very meticulous process of what they have to do to make it, and it's all governed by the government and on all of these types of consortiums. So you know you're getting an authentic product when you go there. Um, for those of you who like the prosciutto di Parma, the, the sorry for the small p on the Parma, for, for those of you who like it, you will find that the, one of the things that makes it unique is that the pigs are fed the leftover whey from making the Parmigiano Reggiano. That's one of the way reasons why it gets so much flavor, in addition to the different breeds and the different things. These types of food traditions are one of the things that help 
helps the Italian economy, that helps the gastronomy around the world, and helps what makes the Made in Italy brand strong. So nowadays, one of the things that we're doing is really trying to promote geographic indicators. A lot of times people will come and, and we'll have events here in D.C. from Switzerland and from, from U.N. and different places. If we can protect, for example, the Idaho potato and the prosciutto di Parma and things like this, Different economies do better. Uh, you know, there's a lot more increased trade. People know what they're buying and they get authentic products. So it's um, it's a thing of the future that to look at. But getting back to the unification of Italy, so Garibaldi, who is probably you know considered to be the, the father of the of the patria and very important general in the Italian army and in, in causing the unification of Italy, he first ate spaghetti al pomodoro in Calabria at uh, this this place that you see over there, Melito di Porto Salvo, and he said to the soldiers, "I swear to you, this." Will be the dish that unifies Italy. So, for those of us who like when we see the dish and we're like, oh no, it's stereotypical, it's not. <laughs> Garibaldi endorsed it. That, that's all we need. We can have it for 5,000 more years. And then, of course, we start to see the mass produced pasta. And, you know, why was there such a need for mass produced pasta? Well, this is when people really started leaving Italy. So, they're leaving Italy. They can't bring with them their pasta making tools, maybe. They don't have maybe the new ingredients to make pasta. They're going to need pasta. And one of the things that fueled our, uh, the way of packaged pasta and pasta as we call it, dried pasta in the world, is uh, this mass immigration. So then we have uh, this invention of Italian-American cuisine. So nowadays, what people were eating maybe on a Sunday in Italy as a, as a you know, luxury food, we're eating more and more commonly as a daily food in America because meat is cheap here. Meat still is cheaper than herbs and then a lot of vegetables and very easy to get. Um, you know, dandelion greens, which we used to eat by the bushel full when I was a kid, are expensive. Meat on the other hand, is cheap. Um, and so there's a, there's a you know, health component to that because the, the name for dandelion in Latin is official disease remedy. And they're expensive. So, but there are also portions. I mean, yes. portions are a big uh, issue, I think, and that's a, a problem here because everybody in the U.S. seems to think that Italians eat all the time, you know, gargantuan portions. And, of course, if you go over there, that's not the way... It is at all. Right. I mean, um, you know, look at that plate of, of spaghetti. Um, that's that's a very American way of serving. <laughs> no offense. And then in, in 1891, there's a book that we actually, Lucia provided for us out there, you can see, La Scienza in Cucina e l'Arte di Mangiar Bene. This was a very important book written by Artuzzi that all the Italian chefs study and, and anybody who's interested in Italian food should look at it because it talks about verismo in the kitchen. So again, this ideal of realism, like we were talking about with Tishir and Caravaggio comes in. And this was wrote, written for the middle classes. So unlike Apicius, who was writing for, you know, the, the emperors and he was a philosopher and unlike later on people who were writing for the cooks of the kings he was actually writing for the middle classes and um one thing about artusi is that uh, he was from um i think emilia romagna but lived for years in florence so i guess the majority of the recipes in his book were from that region but he did gather recipes from around the peninsula and so that was kind of considered maybe one of the first regional cookbooks and it helped to unify um, you know what we know of as Italian cuisine. That's a really good point. That's a very good point because prior to that the books would have been you know from wherever they were written or from wherever the author was written. In the 19th century some of the continuing changes that we see are a lot more lighter more fresh ingredients. Again we're getting away from those heavily spiced really intricate recipes of the Renaissance. Uh, then comes along Puccini and now we're seeing Verismo and this idea of realism in the opera and Puccini talking about very middle-class scenes and very everyday things that you can see and not trying to be so elevated. Uh, uh, this, again, is something that, that transformed and that shows in the kitchen. And also Puccini, because of his success and because of the different global themes that he talked about, he had things set in Asia, he had things set in Paris. So against the backdrop of this mass immigration and people who can't afford to live, you also have people who are really upholding the high end of Italian culture and telling people, okay, this is really what we're capable of in addition to, to some of the problems that are going on. 
Then we have the futurist movement in food. And I know you're going to be having a talk on that very soon, so I won't go too much, but this is really fun. Um, I can't endorse it too much because the first one, no more pasta, which um, to me, life wouldn't be worth living. Um, but they did have some kind of cool ideas. One of them was that the meals had to be in perfect harmony with one another. Um, they had these wonderful table settings. They had all of these kind of sculpted foods. Some of the foods you didn't even eat. They were just placed on the table for your eyes and to attract you and as, as you know, like I can. Modernist candy. cuisine, you yes. know, yeah. Yes, but you literally didn't eat them. Um, they they dis they disallowed political speech at the at the table, which I think is a great idea. They also forbid music and poetry, which is weird because a lot of the more elaborate things up until that day, they used to would actually have people come and recite poetry before you ate or or sing a song or something like that. And then it, probably the most bizarre thing was that they would have these little simulators of airplanes, like they have at the Air and Space Museum. They'd have people go in there and sit, sit to eat, and then they would have they would stimulate movements that were supposed to make people more hungry and and open up their appetite. Yeah. So, but I'll leave that for the for the person who's special in that um, then if we move forward we look we start to develop by now in Italy a really strong sense of style that's respected all over the world so despite problems and despite immigration and things that might have been uh, immigration attributed to it in the past by now we're very respected all around the world in terms of a, a made in Italy and an Italian style and this is a quote by Diego Delle Valle um, also, language and food. So many of our American food products now have Italian names. Some of them are changed a little bit, but a lot of them are, are straight on. You know, pizza, ravioli, pasta. Um, bologna, of course, is a whole different thing, but that's <laughs> this is spelled an Italian word. Coffee, pepperoni. Pepperoni in Italian is peppers. So there is no, the like, pork product that we call pepperoni that does not, uh, yeah. it's not that there. But all of these um, words are some of them. And also we see fashion and different American style icons turning to Italy like Jackie O and, and different actresses for their fashion. That really helped. Food and fashion go hand in hand and whenever people like one, they usually like the other. So this really helped with the food to be spread in the world and films, you know, by Dino De Laurentiis and Carlo Ponti and Sofia Loren and all of these um, wonderful actresses. Also American movies that are going to Italy. Now by this time, Americans want to have their movie shot in Italy. So this, again, added to the appeal. And of course, music. Um, we had so much great music that was coming out of this area. And then American travel. By now, Americans could afford to travel. And you know, we, we had a type of disposable income that would let us go to Italy. So once people went to Italy and saw it for themselves, that's how it became such a great uh, tourist destination that it is. We saw huge changes in the 1970s and the 1980s in terms of what people thought Italian food was, what you could get in restaurants, uh, what recipes were available, all kinds of misconceptions. You know, they started out with that now we're not just Italian anymore, but we're northern versus southern. And there was that whole thing. And Which is still a simplification of the way yes. it actually is. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes it's just because you're on Twitter and you only have a certain amount of characters to use and you can't yeah. say Calabria, Abruzzo, Sicilia, Basilicata. <laughs> you have to just say South. But it's um, changed since then. I mean, I, you know, we don't really see too much of the Northern Southern anymore, right? right. I think it's right. much more regional. Um, you know, there's an attempt to really um, dig down deeper into Italian cuisine here in the U.S. and I think around the world. And then, of course, by the 90s, a lot of Italian food is, is associated with gourmet. So now we have things that aren't even Italian, using Italian names, putting Italian cities, putting um, Italian words, or tr and you know, of course with the olive oil, we won't go there today, but it's a, it's a big thing because by now we've got a gourmet reputation. And so people start to do that and, and also take advantage of it. And then one of the wonderful things that we're doing and we see being done is people preserving the artisan pastas. So. <laughs> Here we have. So this um, is a chitarra from the Abruzzo region, which is where my family is from, and this is. Um, ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, no, no, no. That's fine. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of put it on the chair here. This, um, this is a, actually a tourist one. I have my mother's, but I didn't want to bring it because it's kind of in bad shape. But um, this is actually a 19th century invention. It was. Um, apparently um, invented by the setachi, the, the um, artisans who made the, um, uh, what do you call the setachi? The, the sieves, yeah. Um, so when you made pasta or whatever, you sieved your flour because you wanted to get rid of all the little bits and, and you saved the rest. Um, but this was actually a way to sort of make cutting your pasta easier for housewives. So you'd put your strip of pasta on here and you'd roll this, um, uh, you know, uh, this uh, rolling pin along it and you'd cut the sheet of pasta into strips. So until very recently, Abruzzo was really the only place you could get something like spaghetti alla chitarra 
But now, if you go down to Rose's Luxury, you can get spaghetti alla chitarra because it's become very popular. And this is what's happening with regional Italian cuisine that, um, you know, cooks, cookbook authors, chefs are really digging down because every region, I say, I always say that it, Italy is a small country, but every region is vast and deep. And, you know, I know that every time I go back, I come across recipes that are new to me that are either very old or they're new. And there's, there's just, um, there's always something to discover, which is pretty incredible when you think about how many centuries people have been traveling to Italy and have been mining its food and its culinary scene. So the fact that there are still discoveries to be made, I think, are pretty incredible. I agree. And as we talk about that and Italian food around the globe, uh, this is a, a map from Yelp in Singapore. And you can see how many different tiramisu restaurants there are. <laughs> tiramisu is the number one dessert in Singapore. They love, they're crazy about it. And many places in the world. In, in Morocco, I was seeing it all over the place. And uh, also restaurants named for it. But it, it is definitely the, the most famous Italian dessert in the world. So and I want to say one thing about Singapore. Because I met a chef from Singapore when I was in Italy over uh, this summer. And he's actually Japanese. But he has a restaurant in Singapore. And it's an Italian restaurant. Mm -hmm. And he just won a Michelin star. So that's, you know, talk about global. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. And um, do you want to talk about your brunch? Oh, yeah. So you see those teeny tiny little bagels? Uh, that's my daughter's hand, actually. We were in Florence in this, over the summer, and um, they, our hotel at, at um, uh, happy hour or whatever, co cocktail hour, we put out uh, wine and some little stuzzi, little things to eat. And one day it was these mini bagels. So here we are in the heart of Florence um, snacking on mini bagels. And if you go to Italy, you know, or um, it, you know, the world of the internet and food blogging, I know a lot of Italian food bloggers. And if you look at their sites, you'll see recipes for muffins and cheesecake and, you know, pancakes and when I go to Italy, I don't want to have bagels, you know, I just, I just, that's a personal preference. But of course, you know, if you're Italian, you might want to have bagels, I guess. I don't know. Um, so it's, it's a shifting landscape, I guess. And also you have the, you see the sushi with the Italian flag and over on the right, the pizza and kebabs. So very common, especially in Rome. I, I lived in Rome for a while and the, the pizza, t places where they have the pizza Italia or the hand cut, um, pizza will also have a shawarma stand over in the corner. A lot of them are run uh, by people from the Middle East, and, but they don't call them shawarma, they call them kebab, which after the uh, donor kebab for the Turkish name. So, and some people, you know, have an opinion about that, and they don't like it, and they think that they're ruining the pizzerias, and they're ruining their culture. But if we look back to the history of pizza, the word pizza comes from pide, which is Turkish, so I think it's fair. And there's lots of tiramisu in Turkey, so. Well, and of course, if you go up to the Gran Sasso, you can eat Abruzzese kebabs, arrosticini, which are made with um, mutton, and they're really delicious. So, you know, uh, I'm sure that, that those arrosticini had their origin elsewhere, and um, they were a typical food of, of the shepherds who passed through the area, and they're delicious. Um, so slow food, when I was working on preserving Italy, um, I spoke with a number of food artisans, and I, I profiled a few in the book, but some of them work with the slow food um, movement and um, an organization and one of the wonderful things that they're doing is they are they've been working to preserve um, you know specific varieties of tomatoes or artichokes or, or beans um, and they're not just doing this in Italy they're doing this around the world um, so that these traditions and these foods um, are, are not lost to us you could also join Slow Food DC. We have a local chapter. They give something called the snail of approval to local purveyors and restaurants who use local sustainable ways. So it's a, if, if you're here, it's a, it's a great thing to do. And then we'll end with this great uh, quote, il cibo gradito e meglio digerito. So <laughs> the food that you enjoy is best digested. And thank you all. We'd love to take questions if you have them. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay, I always have multiple part of questions. So for the first time this weekend, I, I ate Reginetti. You ate what? Pasta. Reginetti. Oh, Reginetti. Yes. How many kinds of pasta are there? So that's a great question, and I don't know if there is a, um, a specific answer. There's all the varieties of dried pasta, and then all the varieties of fresh pasta. So where did you have your reginette? In New York. In New York. <laughs> and so I wonder if that was a fresh uh, pasta. It was fresh. It was fresh. It was fresh. What, is it, what did it look like? Uh, like a little kind of a 
wiggled ribbons kind of twisted mm -hmm. with a scalloped mm -hmm. edge mm -hmm. and yeah, I mean, especially in the last couple of decades, the, the shapes have, re uh, they've just been more and more shapes that come out and they're very whimsical and, and um, some are traditional, but many these days are not traditional anymore. I mean, um, there's a shape now that, that I see in stores called the calamarata and it looks like a calamari ring and you serve it with a seafood sauce, but you know, when I was growing up that didn't exist. So. Um, I, I don't know if there's an answer. I would say hundreds. <laughs> I it mean, is, uh, yeah, is, honestly. Yeah. But also, oh. sometimes people are people take uh, pastas that are traditionally made uh, fresh and they they make them into a dried pasta or vice versa. Right. There's one that's normally yeah. dried that then they'll start they'll, in a restaurant. will say, oh, we want to do that fresh. But in, in Italy, there might not be a tradition of making that pasta fresh. That happens too. Yeah. And the second part of my question is. Uh, Exactly. What does antipasto mean, and why is it called? Why is mortadella called mortadella? <laughs> so antipasto is anti is before pasto, before the meal. So it's your appetizer essentially. Um, and mortadella is called mortadella because I don't know. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> does anybody know? No. I'd love to know that. That's no. a good one. I'll we'll research it. You know, I mean, well, yeah. Something like that, but it's delicious. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. First of all, I want to thank you, both of you, for this amazing speech. It's uh, wonderful to hear from you all about Italy. We're Italian, so far. we don't know. Never enough, you know. So mm -hmm. I do have a question. So when I grew up in a restaurant, my mother was a chef, my grandmother was a chef. I'm not a chef, but I eat it a lot. And we where? <laughs> where, <laughs> where in Italy? Uh, Liguria. Liguria. Oh, Liguria. the best. So wonderful. when I moved here 10 years ago, and every day mostly that I go, like today, in a business meeting, and they invite me for lunch in an Italian restaurant, <laughs> and that's the most awful thing I can do with the attitude. I see on the menu pasta with Alfredo sauce. Where is this coming from? Because we don't have it. I mean, I never have it in Italy as Alfredo sauce, and here it's everywhere. In the last day, the number of all food that we taste in Alfredo too. So, so, can you please allow me to? So that's a great question. I know it's not an, it's not Italian. It, no. it was, um, but it uh, and I'm surprised to see, to hear that places still serve it because I I had mentioned that I think a lot of chefs are really trying to do justice to Italian. Um, food still using local like ingredients. But on. <laughs> so do you know the story? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, the, the, the popular story, whether it's lore or real or not, was um, in the early part of the 20th century in Rome, a lot of the actors and actresses were going there, and Mary Pickford, who was a prominent silent film star actress here in the United States, went to one of the Roman chefs and asked for something like, similar to like Cacio e Pepe, but with cream. And so they made that for her, and apparently his name was Alfredo, and the restaurant, the recipe became known as Alfredo. So, so even though it's not an Italian recipe that people would eat and enjoy at home, it, it came back here because she was Mary Pickford, so it got introduced as an Italian yeah. recipe. Okay. Thank you so much. But there are other There are other dishes like that. Yes. Uh, Susan Finstead, it's uh, such a pleasure to be here and to, and to learn about this. Uh, not to say anything except something good. Are there places that you can recommend in Washington, D.C. to get Italian food that isn't Italian style, but would be something that would seem to you to be what you would enjoy? I can tell you what I enjoy, um, and it's not like going to a restaurant in Italy necessarily, but I, like I said, I do think that chefs are really trying to do justice. Um, now, I haven't been in mm, a number of years, but Obelisk is um, you know, said to be a, a good Italian a restaurant here in D.C. That's, that's been around for a long time. Um, I am a fan of um, Michael Schlau's restaurant, Alta Strada, which um, yeah, Alta Strada, which is on K Street, and that's pretty new. And he's opened a seafood restaurant called Casolare. Um, so those are a couple. Um, Nick Stefanelli in uh, near Union Market has a restaurant called Masseria, which is very high end, um, but Italian. And also high end are the Fiola and Fiola Mare. So are they? I mean, and. The chef from Fiola is uh, from Le Marche, Fabio Trabocchi. So, um, you you know you can get. It, it's still not to me. I mean, the food at these places I think is really wonderful. It's not like going to um, you know an agriturismo in um, the Maiello Mountains, which is like you know, what I like to do when I, <laughs> when I go here. <laughs> but um, but yeah, uh, 
I, I think there's, do you have? Uh, I also recommend El Tiramisu on P Street yeah. and Aperto on I Street. Right, and he's from question. Basilicata, right? Yes. So he's from Italy as well, yeah. You had a question. Uh, you pointed out the regional variations uh, of food in Italy. Well, of course, Italian-American food uh, is, is very varied too, especially like pizza, like I swore by uh, New Haven pizza, uh, especially with white clam sauce, but, uh, but uh, versus that, that bread in Chicago. <laughs> the deep dish pizza, yeah, yeah. Uh, and of course, Detroit style pizza and St. Louis pizza. Of course, in St. Louis, they fry the ravioli. Yeah, yes, so there are then, regional differences yeah. in Italian American cuisine for sure, yeah. Or any of those popular in Italy. Not that I know. I don't think they're popular. There is some, I did see somewhere that there is an Italian American restaurant in that has. In Rome? In Rome? I thought it was Milano. Really? Maybe, maybe both. Maybe both. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've seen the Rome one. so, you know, the food came back here and now it's gone back there. I'd be curious to try it. I, you know, I, I, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I have a question. Uh, when I lived in Italy, or when I first, you know, lived in Italy, I was told a lot of things like, first of all, you do not order cappuccino after mm -hmm. afternoon. No. That's, right. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Never, ever. And that, that kind of uh, tags you as an American or yeah. you know, non-Italian. <laughs> and the second thing was that you never, ever put grated cheese on seafood pasta exactly. or mushroom pasta. <laughs> but I mean, is, that, yes. is that a practice? Is that a kind, some kind of rule about this? Yes, and best not to question it. Now, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, cappuccino is a breakfast uh, drink. If you have it in the afternoon, it'll sit in your stomach like a stone. You know, that's what I think the Italian... Um, but we all have our own habits. I mean, here we drink, you know, coffee yeah. or the venti, trenta, quaranta, ching, I don't know how big <laughs> Starbucks, you know. Um, and, and then... I think there are rare exceptions with the seafood, um, and I, I thought of one the other day and now it escapes me, but in general, seafood doesn't um, call for cheese. They just clash of uh, flavors and... Um, does anybody have a more specific answer to that? Yeah, well not, not more to that, but just to add on. There, there are so many more, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that when pe people try to learn about Italian food is that they might learn how to make a recipe or they might learn how to make two or three things, but even pairing them together or when to serve them or what goes together is so difficult. It's one of the, my main objectives for the series I'm going to teach next year. Um, for example, in a, in a course, you would never have soup and then pasta. It's soup or pasta as, as a first course. And, but there, sometimes I find American chefs doing Italian food and, and they'll have like a prefix menu that's like soup and then pasta and it's, you know, and it's, it's really, it's, it's strange to see it. It's, um, and I once described it to one of my editors as, you putting these together in a picture is like putting a corn dog on a silver platter on an American cookbook. Like, nobody would do it. <laughs> so there are a lot of things. It takes time, and, and when you're there, you learn them. And, and you could get little by little in cookbooks, but I don't think anybody's ever done one thing that has, like, all the rules. You know, that would be fun. That would be fun and, and a very complicated yeah. process, yeah. <laughs> very controversial. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, we thank you yeah, all for thanks coming. Thanks so much for coming, everybody. Thank you all for coming. I am going to introduce Renato Miracco, the cultural attaché of the Italian Embassy in Washington, D.C., because he will give us some conclusions about this uh, event. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Really, really, really thank you. Uh, as you know, this is this, the first day of the Italian cuisine in in the United States. They decide just to have during the Thanksgiving week. But you say, are you getting crazy <laughs> during <laughs> during the Thanksgiving week? Week we can have it, we cannot have just the cu Italian cuisine in the United States. So we decide just to anticipate. And um, thank you to Domenica. Thank you to Emmy. It was really really amazing. This is a really the big. St uh, start of, uh, of, 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 of the week. This will be just only the start. Maybe next year we'll be, we have much more time just to think about just uh, some, some news about cuisine. 
Uh, we started anyway, we started with the Library of Congress. I'm really honored just to be a partner of this one with the Library of Congress. We started just idea to have just a new idea of food uh, in September when we were part of a festival, National Festival uh, book and with two uh, events related, related to Italian cuisine. So, and we thought about how we can give uh, 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 just a new images of Italian cuisine we, because uh, the mix of uh, generation, the mix of, of culture, the mix of, uh, uh, of people all over the world, and we have to update the idea of Italian cuisine. Uh, in, 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 in the meantime, we have to preserve uh, 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 all the Italian cuisine. And this is another project that I'm leading. So preserving our heritage is another uh, thing that the Italian embassy at, uh, at UNESCO are doing this year, 2016, and will do in the 17 and 18. What does it mean that just to preserve our uh, culture, preserve our monuments, but preserve in the meantime our recipe, our smell, something that we, we can give to the next generation. So uh, uh, Elisa will be there, uh, sign if you would like to, and thank you for coming, and thank you really, Lu Lucia, to host another be beautiful event here. And thank you to both of you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.